it's always great to catch up with someone, a familiar face who you haven't seen for a while. And I always think to myself, what, where are they now? What are they doing? Paul, it, it's fantastic to welcome you to rugby. I mean, you're liking one of our new sets. I love it, mate. It's great. Last we heard, and a lot of fans out there will have seen you playing for Catalan. So before then Leeds, obviously, where we sat now and, and Wakefield before that. But um, before we get to Catalan, I, I wanted to just listen to your rugby league journey because you captain the Cummels. Not many people have done that. That must have been a really proud moment for you and your family. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, well, just a, just a brief about my bit of my journey. Uh, I was born in Papua New Guinea. My father was Australian. Mum's um, Papua New Guinean. Uh, I, yeah, I was born there till I was about six years old. And then my father got uh, TB uh, in Papua New Guinea. So we had to go to uh, Australia. And that was the only reason sort of that brought me to Australia and um, uh, pretty much was just dropped in from PNG, you know, out in the bush to just <laughs> dropped into, uh, into school, couldn't speak English, uh, really struggled, very quiet in class. Um, and a, a kid befriended me and took me to a game called Rugby League and that's sort of how I uh, played the game. I played it before I, it was, before I could speak English and, and I've played it ever since. And the only things I ever wanted to do was uh, play for the Kumuls. So I saw them play sevens on TV and they were doing all trick tries and backflips and not that I ever did that, but uh, I, was just, just, I was just in awe and I, I just wanted to play for them and play first grade and uh, I was able to do that. Yeah. Did it come easy to you? Did it come naturally? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. I just, I like, I like the toughness of it. I like, I like, I think I got, I think actually, funny enough, I think I got concussed in my first game, actually, uh, a, a girl, because you can play, you know, mixed, mixed teams and I think a girl batted me and I, <laughs> I remember just coming to it and then that was it. I was done. I was uh, hooked, hooked ever since though. What I love about PNG is that it's the only country in the world where rugby league is the national sport. Yeah. Jamie Jones went there uh, <laughs> last year. You can see photos now and images of, of the trip, but I've never seen people so passionate about the sport. And I always think to myself, we're, we're so lucky. We take for granted what we have in, in this life and the, the kids playing with one boot, sharing a pair of boots yeah. and using the boot as a kicking tee. And yet they find so much joy in the game and it's so important to their way of life as well as the faith. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that really interested me. But can you tell us, elaborate a bit more about what rugby leagues and the faith means to Papua New Guineans? Oh yeah, I mean, faith is a, uh, to, to Christian country. Uh, the faith is a lot, everyone's at church and, um, I, th I guess like all the other island countries, really, it was quite similar in that way. But uh, but rugby league in Papua New Guinea is uh, is something else. I, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I remember just going even to my village. There's no power or anything like that. You go and there's little shacks and people don't really have much. But they'll someone will walk around with a brand new like uh, NRL jersey or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's Where did you get it from? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Everyone's got either a new or an old one, but it's 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 you know, it's rugby league. It's yeah. everywhere, and they've got footy. I remember I before I even made my debut, I went to watch this thing, and they had uh, a full uh, you know A grade, reserve grade, all the way down. We had pre-match games. In saying that, it wasn't like in a stadium. It was uh, it was the, the 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 ground was all over the place. There's pigs running across. Um, a guy had to walk around and like whip the ground because. Every time the ball would go to the other end, all the crowd would run on the field to see <laughs> if they scored or not. So the guy would come around and start whipping them with a with a stick so they had to run back and they just love it. They just love it. And the, the goalposts are made out of sticks tied with uh, vines and um, had someone calling the game and with one of those uh, old things. And yeah, it was it was awesome, you know, and that's, and that's it, that's it. And this was out in the mountains. Like I'm from uh, Western Highlands, so I'm, uh, you know, like a mountain man from, from the mountains. <laughs> There's no beaches or anything where I'm from, like, uh, like one of the other Cornwalls, David Mead. But, um, yeah, that's where I'm from. And, uh, you know, right up into the mountains, if you go further in, uh, someone will be wearing a, a NRL jersey or a shirt or a cap or something like that. They love it. Jonesy said, no matter how remote they went, no matter which part of the island, what school they went to, all the kids knew the players, they knew the names. Yeah. The, the, the rugby league knowledge was insane. Yeah. How, for a start, and also, who inspired you growing up? Who was your hero? Who was Paul Layton's hero as a young kid? Um, oh. looking, looking at, I want to be that guy. Oh, I don't, 
I, I only I admired Jeff Toovey from Manly Seagulls only because uh, he was just small and I was small so I just was like he was a complete opposite uh, you know he's Aussie dude uh, blonde hair you know really blonde and that but I was like uh, J- Jeff Toovey I'll, I'll, you know he's awesome because he's uh, cause he's hair and that and uh, so small but that's that that was about it growing up because I was only pretty small but um but yeah they I don't you know they just if there's one TV, there's going to be about 100 people watching that one TV. It's so amazing. TV, radio, newspapers. So they're all, uh, you know, uh, a lot of players don't know how famous they are back in Papua New Guinea. So if they go back there and you say a name, they'll be like, oh, they'll, they'll know their name or something like that. So yeah, you're like a god there now. <laughs> no, 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 no. Really. Stanley, Stanley Guinea is the, yeah. Yeah, he's, all the older boys are very well known there. And uh, Adrian Lamb, Stanley Jean, uh, David Mead. There's going to be a documentary, a film coming out in a few weeks called Power Mary, yeah. about the uh, the orchids who yes. went to the World Cup. What an amazing story that is, yeah. because it talks about equality, women's rights. It's much deeper than rugby league, and rugby league is just a vehicle mm. to kind of break down a lot of barriers. Is it tough for women in Papua New Guinea? Yes, yes, it is. I think um, PNG is uh, pretty pretty far. You know, been left pretty far behind. And we're catching up very quickly, but I think it's a very, I mean, we are a Christian country, but it's very man dominated. So I could see since I started to, to now, the absolute transformation in uh, women's, the power of, you know, power of Mary, like uh, powerful women. And uh, it's promoted a lot more and uh, the, whole, the whole culture has changed so quickly. It's, uh, it's really amazing. And I think um, sport in general, uh, especially what they're doing, Power Mary, because rugby league is so big, it's changing a lot of um, a lot of thoughts on the issue, and I, I think it's terrific. And uh, I remember in the World Cup, we actually they were doing the, the 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 videoing of it, and it was just terrific to see all the ladies there. All the the guys go through a bit, but the ladies uh, really go through a lot more. I think find it a lot tougher in a in a tough country to um, to get by each day. So you know, I was really really proud of them. Yeah. I think tough is, is a word that I'd use um, with every single Papua New Guinean I've ever met, the hard as granite uh, and, yes. and the tough competitors. And you took that into the NRL because you pick, picked up by Penrith and you, you played over 100 games uh, in the NRL. That must have been a great achievement for, for a young boy, quiet boy from Papua New Guinea. Yeah, it was. Um, it was just chatting a bit earlier. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it feels like it's just gone so fast, you know? Everyone always says that when you're playing, but yeah, it just feels like it's gone so fast. And I was, it was a really good achievement for myself to get over 100 games, um, which is pretty hard to do, and I'm pretty proud to have done that. Um, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a pretty good experience. It, it, I sort of left left home when I was young, and uh, it just felt like I was going to a camp. You know, like we have always had camps on the weekend. Pat me bags went out, and I haven't been home since. You know, I go back for Christmas every now and then, but yeah, I left when I was young and. Been our way since, so yeah, pretty good journey. I've got a few mates at Wakefield, and it's a really special club, and they're doing so well now. They're doing so well. Danny Kerman's one of my best mates in rugby league, and you rocked up at Wakefield. How did you get to Wakefield? How did that, <laughs> that come about? Because we've seen some big names drop into Wakefield. Dave yeah. Fafita at the moment, Paulie yeah. Paulie, and it's a club with open arms. The fans and the club are so close. Yes. And did, did it help you settle? being at a club like Wakefield? Oh yeah, it's the most, uh, the most fun I ever had. Uh, well, ever. Super, Super League in general. Uh, as soon as, cause in NRL it's pretty, you know, it's pretty tough. And, uh, and sometimes I think that I felt the fun that I had to play the game was taken away and I didn't really enjoy it. So I was just going through the motions and I just, uh, my last two years at Cronulla, you know, we had the whole Cronulla scandal and everything, but the last two years, I just hated the game. I just didn't want anything to do with it. I was I was well over it. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. And then I met Richard Agar actually in Cronulla. And when I sat down with him and how real he was and how honest and upfront he was, and I just loved it. And I was like, yeah, I'd like to play for this guy. And that was it. Yeah. And I come over to come over to Wakefield and just absolutely loved it. The boys were great. The fans, the club. I mean, it wasn't a big club. I mean, I went from like. Cronulla on the beaches, you know, new gym and everything to, you know, went to Wakey, it was a bit bit smaller and um, very cold, but uh, probably the best deci- best decision I've ever made, yeah. Leeds Rhinos saw your talent, everyone yeah. saw your talent, 
and you were really known for being quick around the rope, but being really tough in defence. And I think that in the modern era, a hooker who can defend properly, like a Danny Houghton, they probably not always get the plaudits, but you made that a real feature of your game. Was, was that always been part of your game, that toughness? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think um, I just, because even from when I was young, you know, I, I like the toughness of the game. I, you know, I mightn't be so, uh, read the game as well, but to be fair, I didn't really study it that much either. So I just, I just like uh, being with my mates and just playing hard and just enjoying, enjoying it, you know, and if it's fair on the field, do it, you know, um, and after the game, have a couple of beers and enjoy, enjoy each other's company. I, I've, always, I've always liked, enjoyed that. And I think that's why I left the NRL. As soon as I stopped to enjoy the game like that, I just, I just didn't want to be part of it, so. What, what were it like to the transition from Wakey to Leeds? Because although there's only seven miles or so between the clubs, yeah. it's, it's worlds apart mm. as yeah. far as like the size of the facilities and everything else. Did you, did you feel different playing for Leeds compared to Wakefield? Were it more yeah. pressure? Uh, at, first, at first, yeah, I was a bit worried because it's a new club and I haven't enjoyed, Wake, you know, enjoyed Wakefield so much. Like it, I loved it. And, uh, and I hadn't had that in the game for really for, for in the game. So, you know, I, I was so comfortable and enjoyed it. I really, I was even willing to stay even longer, but the club was having financial problems at the time. So um, yeah, I got picked up by Leeds, but they're complete opposite, but they were both just as good. Yeah. You know, Leeds is just, you know, even now I come, went to Wakefield and I just feel like I'm at home. I go to Leeds and all the boys, the players, the staff, the fans. I just, I just love it. Uh, the Super League is just, you know, something special. I, yeah, best decision to come over here. And the two clubs are, like you said, complete opposite, but they're just, they're so good in their own ways. And I, I like both equally, yeah. Were you sad to leave Leeds? Very, yeah, very, yeah. Very. You, but you go to the, you go back to the beaches, for, so it's full circle. Yeah. Back to the yeah. beaches of Cal yeah, Cane yeah. Beach. Yeah. And it must have been like, I know a lot of people have gone there, Leon Price speaks so highly. Yeah. The club, Mickey Max, loving life over there. Yeah. It's changed his life, he's changed the person. Yeah. Um, but you, you rock up there and it's all going okay. Yeah. Um, but then you start having some problems with concussion. Do you want to talk yeah. us through yeah. what happened? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I'll go through quickly. So, uh, so I got the chance to go to um, Catalan Dragons. Um, I took that chance and went over there. And uh, what, what actually happened was my first game for the, for the club, I tore my pec and bicep. So that, that took me out of the game for months. So it wasn't a very good start. And then as soon as I, as soon as I get back, uh, there was a Cronulla uh, 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 scandal from many years ago when I left the NRL. That caught up to me. So then I was banned. So I couldn't really settle in. So uh, that, was, that was out. So my first really full year was uh, 2017. And towards the back end of 2017, I started getting more concussions than when probably than usual. You know, in rugby league, I think, um, now is a lot, it's very, you know, it's probably more, more known and people, you know, need to take more care. But, you know, as back then a little bit, sort of you copped a knock and that was just carry on sort of thing. And that's because we didn't know. Yeah. But now, you know, there's a bit more knowledge and people are being a bit more careful. And I think that's a really good way to go. But towards the end of uh, 2017, uh, you know, I met my wife now, uh, she's French and met her over there and we were living together. But towards the end of 2017, um, she started no noticing my behaviour was a little bit off. Like what? What do you mean? Uh, she'd like, like I'd be talking, I'd be talk, we'd be talking in, in conversation, and then I'd either change to something else completely off topic, and she'd be like, uh, "What are you? What are you doing? You know, like it's completely, completely off topic." Or I'd just forget my line of thought, and I'd be asking you what I was talking about, and yeah. you know, and just things like that, uh, emotional uh, mood swings, and. I was a little bit, you know, and just, it wasn't all at once, but she just started to pick things up and she made me more aware of it. Yeah. Because before I didn't know, but when someone's there with you every day and they care about you, they start to pick up on things and she's mentioned it, mentioned it, mentioned it. And then it was, and then um, one game I remember, played Hull away. I got knocked out twice in, in the game. One, I was a bit all over the place and then I got up and then I, again, and then I, I went off and, uh, and you just, yeah, you don't think at the time because yeah, I'm not used to that. So, you know, I'm, I'm used to just carrying on and yeah. carrying on. But, but now that there's a bit more knowledge, I'm starting to do a bit more research. So 
I uh, did some concussions in the World Cup, quite a lot actually. And uh, got towards the end where I was, I, I was going, I think my last game ever for, in rugby league was probably the worst game I've ever played in my life. Which one? It was, um, it was the Challenge Cup round one, York. And uh, it was just, it was just a shameful game. I, I uh, hit my head on the ground on the top of my head. And uh, it a, it's only a little split, split out, but I'm going into tackles not wanting to get my head in. Yeah. And it was just the worst game ever played. And it was, I just, it was, you know, yeah, shit. You just knew then? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was going into the game just not wanting to tackle and, yeah. Can I ask you, there's a lot at the moment, there's a lot of um, rugby league is a family sport. We know that. We, yep. we love that about it. But I think that clubs are starting to understand that the rivalries of old um, a great sales points. Now the game has been sanitised to a point. The band the shoulder charge. If you throw a punch now, you're off. Stuff like that, which is which I agree with to, to a point. But would you, as a player, bring back the shoulder charge? Oh yeah, I think. Even though you've been through all conclusions, because yeah. it doesn't does it does it? I, I'm always asking. I never yeah. played at the top level, but yeah. does it? Is it an unsafe way to tackle? If, if you hit someone with the shoulder like you do in the head, like you would with an arm, then it should be sanctioned. But yeah. would you bring the shoulder back for the entertainment of the game? Yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah. If you're not going in, like I said, like when I was when I playing, if you're doing everything legally, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, if you're going in to shoulder charge with your elbow like this at someone's head, probably not. But if it's just a shoulder, like you know, the good good shoulder charge, yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's good. If it's legal, do it. I think, yeah. But not, you know, going in like this, yeah. you know. That, yeah, that, Nick Fozzer. Yeah, yeah, no, no, don't do that. Paddy Dog. <laughs> um, yeah. You've had an amazing career, Paul. Yeah. And it's, and it's been a pleasure to know you and become friends. But life moves on. And you're a father now. Tell us about being a it all, father. At, it all happened at once. It all happened at once. How, how did you feel when you got the news? Uh, yeah, I was on my way to training, actually. I was still playing at this stage. Yeah. But um, I think I was just going through it. But uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, I mean, waited a long time. And when I got the news, I was pretty happy. Yeah, well, I was a bit numb, actually. I didn't know yeah. how, to, how to react. It's I didn't, crazy. It took it's a, a weird while. Feeling, yeah. yeah, for me, it take, I don't know if it's just me, but it takes a long time to settle in. So it took a really long time to settle in. Even when, when he came, I was like, oh, geez, you know. But uh, yeah, it's best, the best thing, yeah. My oldest is 13, it's still unsettled. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. It's still unsettled. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it led, you, you, you finished your career, you finished playing yeah. uh, because of the problems with concussion. But um, your missus said, well, what, what are you going to do next? And what yeah. are you doing now? Tell us about well, this. Uh, this is amazing. This is unbelievable. So it's so random, actually. But <laughs> so I was, uh, so I was, actually, I was still playing. Yeah. And uh, I was like, you know, I'm thinking about finishing maybe in a couple of years because yeah. my body's feeling pretty good. I feel a few years or whatever. But I wouldn't mind doing something on the side yeah. uh, while I'm playing. That was the key, uh, while I'm playing, so sort of I can, you know, play and do a bit on the side, maybe get an income while I'm doing this. And uh, my, my, my partner, uh, the wife now, said, uh, well, my father's retired, but he was in the bicycle business. And I was like, the bicycle business? He goes, yeah, he's in the bicycle business, and uh, he's been doing it for 20 years, and uh, so for me... He's done I, all right out of it. Oh, he's done all right, yeah, he's, yeah, he's had a good life and um, done a lot of things, and. Uh, I said, well, I don't know, I can't remember the last time I rode a bike, you know. I, she said, come around, we'll have a family, uh, you know, ride, family riding. And I was like, yeah. family riding? Oh, okay, uh, you yeah, know. Is that part of French culture? Yeah. That's what French people do. They love bikes, yeah, yeah. like really. And uh, I went there and uh, I went to bike and it was like, a, you know, like electric. And I was like, oh, what's this? So as soon as I had a go, it was so much fun. So it's not, it's not a pedal bike, it's electric as well. Yeah, yeah, like it's so, you can turn the electric soft, but as soon as you start to pedal, it'll start to kick in and just, because my knees are a bit, I'm 27, but you know, my knees are a bit, um, <laughs> bit, bit stiff. So it sort of, it kicks in and uh, you can increase the, uh, the power as much as you like. So, the, so I bought some bikes and, uh, and then I found out that I was having a child and then my concussions kicked in. So it sort of all happened at the same time. So my plan was to continue to play and- um, Pay the bills. Yeah, yeah, pay yeah. the bills and do the bikes. Yeah. But uh, I just, I can't, I just can't, so. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, I got the bikes and um, I've been doing that, uh, doing that since, yeah. And I specialize in fat bikes, so. And how's business? 
It, I've just literally just started. <laughs> Actually, just started. I, um, if you need a bike, yeah, see this yeah, model. See yeah. this model if you need a bike. I, I, put, I put a, filled our trailer full of bikes. Uh, finally got them. We're carrying them in between so the wheels don't get on the dirt and stuff. Put them in the trailer, take off, and the, the bikes fall and scratch up all my bikes. So um, yeah, right. had to get some more. But uh, yeah, it's good. No, it's good. It's really good. A lot of fun. We had a bit of a ride earlier on and uh, had, a, had a lot of fun. So it's good. It's, I mean, it's good for the environment. Gets people out. Gets people with stiff knees like myself to get back on a bike again and uh, keep fit. So it's great for older people who might have. Oh, obviously, it's a big one, yeah. Yeah, and being a keen biker during the life, yeah. keen cyclist, and then they can't get up the hills like they used to with the fat bikes. It's a bit electric, goes along. electric, yeah, yeah, just going along. It's good. It goes, uh, the uh, the tyres, uh, you can put snow tyres so you can go, you know, if it's a. If it's um, iced over roads or uh, on the beach, there's no beaches here, but you know, in Leeds. But uh, you can go on the beach, electric mountain, beach. electric. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's all good. So it's, uh, it's a good product. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming down, Paul. No it's great to see you doing so well. Uh, Jimmy Brewer, our editor, is a keen cyclist. So we sent Jimmy off with the team uh, to take Paul and try out the bikes at Roundy Park. Check this out. Bonjour, je m'appelle Paul Eitan. Uh, this is this is Aiton Bikes. Uh, Small venture that I started after finishing footy. Uh, it's a seven speed Shimano, uh, disc brake, Tektro, Mozo shocks, 48 volt Samsung battery, uh, 500 watt motor. Uh, it's, it's a fat bike, as you, you could probably see, the size of the wheels. Uh, invented for the snow, so you can put snow, snow tires on there, so you can ride in the snow or on the icy, icy roads and feel pretty safe. So, we've got a lot more information on aitonbikes.com. Uh, we got a new shipment coming in uh, in May, so if you want to if you want one of these, to have a bit of fun on over in the summer, winter, actually any time. Uh, just jump on there and uh, we'll sort you out. The thing about these bikes is you don't just get it in the summer and uh, you know keep it in the cupboard in the winter. They're actually originally uh, they're, they're snow bikes, so you're gonna have a, you got a nice fat tire and you got to have uh, metal metal uh, studs in, in the tire so you can ride in the icy icy roads with the snow. We've got a throttle here but it's limited at six, six k's an hour. So it's just basically to help you get going. So, cause you know, sometimes you might have maybe something in your hand or you just hard to get, get things going. You just uh, squeeze the tr throttle just to get you going. Basically it's pedal assistance bike. So you can have as much as, as, or as little assistance as you want. Um, you can easily change it like this all the way up to uh, the, the six, level six or no assistance at all. That way you just use it as a normal bike um, or your battery runs out, uh, you just use it as a normal bike. So uh, let's just start things off a bit. Let's put it on one and uh, just to get things going, pull the, pull the throttle a little bit. And we get things going here. We ride like this and if the, the more assistance you want, you just keep doing the plus, it'll go up to level six. And uh, yeah, you can just go up the hills, pretty simple. <laughs> Hey, you can beat that. <laughs> it's good TV, eh? <laughs>